This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. More than 4 billion people live across this vast continent called Asia. And we are telling their stories. On this edition, learning from tragedy. A building collapse in 2013 that killed thousands of workers prompts drastic changes in Bangladesh's garments industry. But are they enough? Bangladesh is now able to market itself as probably the safest garment industry in any of the developing countries because they're the only ones that have been subjected to a inspections regime of the type that we have. And coming home. Citizens who left Myanmar during its decades of isolation are back to bet on the country's future. I'm extremely hopeful. I try to be optimistic. I'm Michal Bardavid and this is Assignment Asia. Welcome to the program. April 24, 2013 will always be remembered as a tragic day in Bangladesh. An eight-story building housing garment factories collapsed, killing more than 1,100 people and exposing the harsh conditions faced by laborers who produce clothes for Western brands. Years later, the country's garment industry has taken steps to improve working conditions and safety standards. Ryan Meltzer was in Bangladesh to see what's being done to ensure no disaster like it will ever happen again. A survivor of the Rana Plaza collapse cleans a memorial to the more than 1,100 people who lost their lives there. Mohammed Kabir Mola was trapped for four days and nights when the building with garment factories, shops and apartments crumbled in 2013. It was the deadliest accidental structural collapse in history. Mohammed was one of the lucky ones. A few meters away, just in front of where the building once hummed with thousands of sewing machines, a portrait of a woman who died beneath the rubble hangs in her husband's shop. Four years on, survivors like Hajera Begum bear the lingering physical and psychological scars. A day before the collapse, cracks appeared in the building, but the owner assured everyone it was safe and the garment factories ordered Hajera and the other workers to go inside. Shastichai 46 people have been charged in relation to the collapse, which was blamed on substandard construction materials and the building's conversion from commercial to industrial use, among others. But no one has yet been convicted. This is where Rana Plaza stood until April 24, 2013. It was initially designed as a four-story commercial building housing offices and shops and never designed for factories with heavy machinery and vibrations. Another four stories were added to the building without permits. Western clothing companies donated to a $30 million trust fund administered by the International Labour Organization to boost the meager compensation the Bangladesh government provided to the victims' families and survivors. Local development agency BRAC 
has contributed to the fund. It is also helping hundreds of survivors to get medical treatment and counseling and develop new livelihoods with funding from Walmart and the ILO. Mohammed Ripon Mia, who broke his back in the Rana Plaza collapse, is one of the beneficiaries. The Rana Plaza collapse came just months after a deadly fire swept through another Bangladesh garment factory and killed more than a hundred people. Few countries are as reliant on a single industry as Bangladesh is on its garment sector. It directly employs more than 4 million people and indirectly sustains more than 20 million, a $28 billion industry that accounts for more than 80% of Bangladesh's exports. The garment industry has helped Bangladesh halve the number of people living in poverty since 2000, with women benefiting the most. Rosina Akta says her garment factory job has boosted her self-confidence and independence. But the twin Rana Plaza and Tazreen disasters months apart plunged the industry into crisis, threatening millions of jobs and the country's economy. Global name brands that produce their clothes in Bangladesh faced a backlash from labor groups and consumers. The industry and the country had no choice but to clean up their act fast. European clothing brands and retailers stepped forward first, signing onto a legally binding agreement called the Accord for Fire and Building Safety. North American firms were more reluctant, signing a weaker, non-binding agreement called the Alliance. To date, more than 220 global apparel companies and retailers, as well as two global trade unions, have signed on to the Tafa Accord, paying up to half a million dollars a year in fees to cover inspections and safety training. The brands are required to have the factory owners of their, that supply them fix all of the safety hazards identified through our inspections. And they've committed in cases where factories do not meet the requirements, that there's a notice and warning period that culminates with ineligibility for that supplier to supply for any of the 220 Accord brands. Inspections revealed a number of frequently recurring and disturbing problems, some of them easily rectified, others much less so. They included locked exit doors, an absence of fire doors, no sprinklers, smoke detectors or extinguishers, and many electrical flaws. Improperly spliced wires overload into the electrical circuit boxes, which are large fire hazards, circuit boxes that were made of flammable materials, wood, buildings that were designed to be four stories, that when we went and inspected them, they were six, seven, eight stories, and there was never any consideration from a structural perspective whether the building could hold that additional weight. Fewer than half of the country's 4,500 garment factories are covered by the Accord. And even with those factories, safety improvements are far from complete. The pace of remediation has been slow. We have a factory base of approximately 1,700, and we have approximately 40 that have completed all of the remediation from the initial inspections. We have uh, close to 250 now, where they've completed 90% or more. Many of the factory owners have just delayed in doing the stuff. And as we've moved along and as time has passed, 
our tolerance for this has diminished dramatically. The Accord's members have stopped buying from dozens of factories and companies that refuse to commit to the required improvements. It's an impressive change that has taken place, undoubtedly. Very significant change. Small and medium factories that cannot remediate are closing down on their own, are relocating to better factories, which is, you know, overall is a good thing that is happening. But many factories terminated by the Accord have just found less picky buyers. Those factories are in an unsafe condition and a debt trap building. Those factories have been not shut down. Those are still in operation, many of them, and they're working. So I'm really worried about if those factories are not taken care by the government or, you know, increasing their safety standards. The government of Bangladesh has beefed up its inspections, boosting its staff and budget, working closely with the Accord and the International Labour Organization. Actually, government is highly committed to ensure the uh, safety of the workers at the workplace. We shall not allow anybody to die at the factory building. This is our bitter experience. We have lost many lives, valuable lives in the factory. Fire safety, electrical safety and building safety. And we have done that. And we are doing that. Our members, everybody knows that if they want to do business with this buyer, if they want to be in this business, then they have to do this. The Accord and the ILO say this is no time for self-congratulation or complacency. In terms of the remediation itself, it is still an ongoing uh, process. It is not finished and, and uh, they, therefore we need to continue to maintain the momentum. Despite two government-mandated pay increases since the Rana Plaza incident, the minimum wage for garment workers is still only $68 a month. It is a time for us to ask job with dignity. So we want the job, we want the jobs with dignity. It may have been self-interest that drove Western companies to push for safer factories, but many believe it is creating a positive and lasting legacy. Bangladesh is now able to market itself as probably the safest garment industry in any of the developing countries because they're the only ones that have been subjected to a inspections regime of the type that we have, actually doing the remediation, having credible verification that the remediation has been done and been done correctly. But for victims of the Rana Plaza collapse, those changes are coming too late. Ujjal Dash spent a year recovering in hospital, but his psychological wounds are still raw. Despite all the improvements, people are still dying in Bangladesh's garment factories. The average death toll up to Rana Plaza was 200 in every year. But the pretty good transformation is now we have, we all together was able to make this or reduce this uh, below 10. The goal is to reduce the number of garment factory deaths to zero so that no more memorials like this will have to be built to remember victims of preventable disasters. For Assignment Asia, I'm Ryan Melsa in Shava, Bangladesh. The struggle continues for the survivors of the Rana Plaza collapse. A survey in 2017 found that more than half of the 1,400 survivors are still jobless and that three out of 10 are too traumatized to ever work again. Next on Assignment Asia, Myanmar's returning citizens are placing their hopes on their country.
Are we ready? China, a nation with the largest population on Earth, assuming a greater role economically and politically on the world stage. Understanding China is critical for all, though difficult for some. Behind the scenes of China's transformation, I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn. Join me to get closer to China. Myanmar lived under military rule for several decades, a period of oppression and isolation that forced many of its people to leave and settle in other countries. But political and economic reforms have drawn some members of the diaspora back to Myanmar in recent years. In the capital Yangon, I met the individuals who came back home with high hopes of shaping a better future for their country. For half a century, this country of Asian pagodas, colonial architecture and rich culture was under military rule, cut off from the rest of the world. But as Myanmar opened itself up in recent years and began reforms, the once isolated country has become synonymous with potential. It is this potential that's drawing many citizens who left the country during its years of isolation back home. During the years before Myanmar opened itself up, many citizens left the country to live abroad because of economic and political restrictions. But many have since returned to their homeland and are supporting the development of their country. Tet Miet U, co-founder of Rangoon Tea House, is one of the returnees. For his leadership potential, the young entrepreneur was included in the Forbes 30 Under 30 Asia list. Tet spent his childhood in the UK and returned to Myanmar in 2012 at the age of 22. But I think where my parents really did a good job was we, we always, even in the UK, they always filled us in on what the country was like. And my mom used to tell me about how when she was a child, they would only have one bar of soap that they could choose from. Ted always knew he would return to his country one day. I, I'd, I'd had such a naive outlook on what this place was like. You know, it's just, you know, I, I knew all these problems associated politically and all these things you'd read on the news, but for some reason I just didn't, that would never stop me from thinking about coming back. Being in Myanmar and going back to the UK from time to time gave Ted a vision of the changes needed in his homeland. I think the most important thing is, is that the poorest people in the country and the least well-off, and you're talking financially, culturally, everything, need to at least benefit from every change that happens. There are the obvious ones like education, healthcare, those are very obvious, but I think the less obvious ones are stuff like insurance. So a lot of my staff, if not most, the majority don't have health insurance. The streets of Yangon, the country's largest city and its commercial center, are bustling with economic activity. The economist Mong Wang So remembers the time before Myanmar's reform when trade was restricted. Some limited, you know, the, even the rice can, you know, we don't move from the, the one region to another region. No, we have to take permissions from the, the authority concerns. Now, if market is required, then we can, you know, trade whatever in the, the whole Burma area. So I think this is a good opportunity for our people. As market restrictions were lifted, competition among businesses was also encouraged. We don't have that the competition power in the market. Of course, you know, the market is a central market, a planned economy. And now government allow, you know, and also they give a chance to promote other, uh, the, all the business to compete in the economy. Many business owners are benefiting from the recent changes in the economy. Reforms in investment legislation have allowed them to expand. Myanmar's A1 Group specializes in construction. Its executive director, Yi Wen Wu, is a returnee who spent 11 years in the United States. The things that caught the attention of Wen Wu in the U.S. were related to her family's business. 
Gongjo the Dari Bot, no, or flyover, bridge day, delo infrastructure, a bot, no, alumnuri, Ninga Yatama, three like day, now shopping more, Singapore, shopping more, alumnuri, three a cut, or good time, Nima, Tanuri, Pitchen, Aragaro, high school beer, Chene, or Nazaro, maybe your time, Jagi, or the Ninanilam Yot, Jang, the Bedo, America, or Trattar. But it's not only bricks and walls that left an impression on her abroad. Myanmar's returning citizens stress the need to improve education in their country among other necessary reforms. In his company, Ted says he sees incredible potential among his employees. Um, and people here are largely independent and they want to make it on their own, but maybe they don't have the educational background to know how to do it. So I think, you know, I try to take on that role at the restaurant too. I know that if they were in another place in the UK or the US, they have the brain and they have the capacity and they have the ethic to be doing something themselves. They shouldn't be working here. So I had a photo of a mimi and photo of me. I made a vegani bio, like Lila Moo, then or about people see me. Despite recent progress in Myanmar, challenges remain. The international community has praised Myanmar for its reforms and political developments have given them more freedom to express themselves. Yet at an economic level, the changes have made little impact on the lives of the general population. While entrepreneurs and big corporations are benefiting from new laws, for some individuals struggling to make ends meet, the story is a little different. The oldest of seven children, Zuzu, works as a vendor to support her family. Her income is barely enough for her family to meet all their necessities. Still, Zuzu acknowledges the changes sweeping Myanmar. Among the most obvious is the increase in tourism. After Myanmar opened its doors to foreigners interested in visiting the country, Zuzu also feels she has more chances of finding a better job nowadays. In October 2016, the U.S. lifted sanctions against Myanmar. The move is expected to boost the country's economy as it undertakes more reforms. I'm extremely hopeful. Um, I try to be optimistic, so if you ask me what I think the country is going to be like in a year's time, I would say that I'd like to think that there will be more people here who, you know, more Burmese people who will be in the middle class more foreigners here who choose to not just come here as tourists but relocate their lives here. The pace of progress and reform can be slow, but Myanmar's returnees believe better days are yet to come, and they've returned home precisely to make that happen. Among the challenges that Myanmar's repatriates often face are the tensions between them and their countrymen who never left, especially when it comes to political issues. Still, they feel their skills and contributions to society are highly valued, and many of them plan to stay for good. You can learn more about this and all the stories on today's program on our website, www.assignment-asia.com. That's all the time we have for this week. I'm Mikhail Badri. Thanks for watching, and join us again on Assignment Asia.